want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south as we bring you the latest teaching in the prophet Hosea. We're going to be in Hosea 5. It's going to be an incredible uh, chapter of the Bible. We're going to see one of the most uh, famous uh, verses of the Bible, how God is going to talk about His second coming. And in the affliction, the Jewish people in the end days will come back to know who the living word, uh, who the living word literally is, our, uh, our Savior, Christ the Lord. And this ties into uh, end time prophecy as Jesus was telling us about the times and the seasons. We know it's in the times and the seasons for the Lord to come. Uh, so look, before we go any further, we want to invite the Holy Spirit to be our true teacher in the living word of God and a special uh, Shanav Tavav to all of our uh, folks in Israel. That is to welcome in the good year uh, in Hebrew. It is the Hebrew uh, New Year of the year 5,779. As yesterday and coming in today is the Feast of Shofars. And the Feast of Shofars is again when the new moon comes in and the Jewish people celebrate in the civil year their new year, it's Rosh Hashanah. And uh, in the uh, festivals of the Lord, it's called the Feast of Shofar. So in the, uh, the, the, the Hebrew, it's the seventh month, even though it's the first month on the civil calendar. So it's a big deal for the Lord to blow in the shofars. Again, to know that when the moon comes in, it took two witnesses to see the crescent of the moon. So that ties into the rapture of the church. It could happen within a 48-hour window. We have the shofar here with us. This is an actual ram's horn from Israel. And um, at the end of it, we'll try to blow it. I do a terrible job of blowing the shofar. Uh, but this is uh, Gideon blew the shofar called Gideon's Call. And the Lord's going to tell us here in Ho Hosea 5 to blow the shofar. And the blowing of the shofar is an in incredible thing if you've ever uh, listened to it. There's a... Um, there's a country music singer that's very famous uh, that had did a whole presentation on blowing of the shofar. Uh, that was done as a vision to me, uh, confirming a prophecy on 777, the exact day that I had the chili. I'll have to dig that up. It's an incredible video. Uh, I believe it's still out on YouTube, so we'll grab it and put it on our Facebook site so people can see it. Uh, I don't think he talks more than two or three times on the whole video. It's just blowing of the shofar. It's just absolutely incredible incredible. So it's a big deal. Uh, year 5,779 in Hebrew, seven is the number of completion. Nine is the, God, the number of God's great patience and the, perf uh, the perfection of God's timing and judgment. Uh, how fitting this is for 5,779. And we always say, look around Israel during the holidays. So Feast of Shofar starts, uh, starts the three festivals. From the Feast of Shofar to the Day of Atonement, Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur. That was the only day that the uh, high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and, and put the blood of uh, the, the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, tradition was that they would always put a rope around the high priest because uh, if the high priest didn't do something holy to the Lord, that uh, he would fall down dead. Uh, so obviously they had a high priest that died in, in the past when that happened because they had to pull him out. And so that's the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> the 10 days uh, in between... Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Shofars to uh, the Day of Atonement or to Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement is called the Ten Days of Awe, and God has given a lot of percent, uh, per, uh, prophetic words about awe. I'm going to go with some great awe. So watch these next next ten days going into the second festival, the Day of Atonement, and then there's a third festival, which is the Feast of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booth. It's called Sukkot. That's where Jacob actually for the first time, uh, created a booth in the name of the Lord. So these are very holy events. These are the three events that, too, that the Lord Jesus Christ has not physically fulfilled yet. These are the only three that are left on the calendar for Jesus to literally fulfill. So we're, uh, as blowing the shofar, uh, and the feast of shofar ties into the, the wedding ceremony of coming in within a 48-hour window for the bridegroom to get the groom, or the bride, ties into the coming of the Lord, uh, which is uh, the next event on his calendar. Okay, let's, so let's get into Hosea 5. God is judging the nation of Israel, specifically Ephraim. You're going to see throughout the scripture, Ephraim and Dan always get the backhand of the Holy Spirit. And we'll explain to you why, because they always play the harlot. And Ephraim was the area that uh, Jeroboam, uh, once Solomon died, he, the, the, the kingdom went to uh, his son Rehoboam, but he was, he had, he was hard-necked. 
And so they split off and to Israel and to Judah. And Jeroboam came in and took uh, the nation of Israel and he had quarter room in the uh, area that God gave to Moses for it, which was called Ephraim to the tribe of Ephraim. So that was the area that they did. They built the their, their temple. That's where Jesus went up to the woman at the well and they were uh, Samaritans. That's where Samaritans came from was Ephraim. And uh, they uh, Ahab actually bought a uh, plat of land there to in Samaria and they called it the Samaritans. They were crossed bred through the Assyrians and the, under the Assyrian captivity. And they were not liked by the Jewish people because they took on different, uh, they took on different gods and did things away from God's precepts and commandments. They tried to take the entire replica of the temple and put it in Samaria or in the area of Ephraim because Jeroboam did not want them to go back to Israel, <coughs> excuse me, because it was a requirement under the law that you would come back to Jerusalem on three of the festivals, the Feast of Shofars, Sukkot, which we call Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. Those were three requirements that you would go back to Jerusalem. So Jeroboam did not want the people to go back to, uh, uh, to Jerusalem because he was afraid that they would stay with the nation of Judah. So he had a replica of all the things and he started worshiping pagan gods and he was taking priests outside of the Torah and they were not Levites because the Levites, you know, the true priestly Levites uh, bled in. You'll hear a false teaching called the, the 10 Lost Tribes of Israel. And that is a misteaching. They're saying, okay, that it's split evenly, that Benjamin and Judah stayed with the nation of Judah. And the other 10 tribes were lost and they went to Ephraim and they all gathered together. But a remnant of all those tribes that really loved the Lord stayed with Judah. So it wasn't 10 lost tribes. It was uh, the, the, the people who had a hardness of heart to choose to live in Ephraim, this, this, the area of, that uh, Ahab later bought called Samaritans. So that's where we find out about the Samaritans and why Ephraim gets the backhand of the Lord because of their holotry and their, their false gods and literally doing incense to false gods and trying to do it in the name of the Lord and uh, went horribly bad. So that gives you an understanding of why God's wrath is coming against Ephraim, Israel, and Judah. But at the end, he tells us a great, great thing. It's an end time prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to the nation of Israel. Oh, that's why Israel, 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 that's why we got to watch Israel. God prevails in the Hebrew that it's, it's his beloved city, Jerusalem. And if you don't love Jerusalem, uh, it's, Jerusalem is the heart of the Lord. And that just, uh, that's where our, our King of Kings and the Lord of hosts is going to reign out of. It's just a glorious city and uh, we can't wait for our King to come home. All right, let's get into scripture and we'll explain it as we go. First, verse 1, very short chapter. I think there's only 15 verses in Hosea 5. Hear this, O priest. He's calling them out, so-called priests that are not doing the priestly line that the law was given to Moses and to Aaron and the Levites to be very specific. He said, take heed, O house of Israel. That would be the house of Israel who separated from Judah and was in the area Ephraim to have their false gods. So they have two arcs of the covenant too. We'll explain that just quickly. Uh, people always ask me, where is the ark of the covenant? Uh, first of all, we don't. We know that the true ark of the covenant is up in heaven, and there is no need for the ark of the covenant because when the Christ comes back, he he will sit on the mercy seat of the ark of the covenant. But the ark, he doesn't need the ark of the covenant because the power of the ark of the covenant was the living God, and the King of Kings and Lord of Hosts will reign on in Jerusalem off the mercy seat. We don't need the the uh, they don't need the Ark of the Covenant. However, uh, this, one of the ancient rabbis has found one in Hezekiah's tunnel. And what I'm told is it's very old and decayed, but they're not sure which one it is because there was two. Because there was the original one that God told Moses to build that they kept in the temple. And some think that the Egyptians took off with it and uh, Josiah is that's why Josiah went out to battle when God didn't want him to go out to battle and he lost his life. So some scholars believe that Josiah, the king of Judah, was going out to rescue the Ark of the Covenant that was taken away from the nation or the nation of Judah at that particular time. But in Ephraim, Jeroboam had a duplicate made of the Ark of the Covenant. Everything in the priestly realm, they tried to make a duplicate of it. So there's two Ark of the Covenant. So even if they found one, you'd have to identify, is this the original one from Moses or is this the replica from 
uh, Jeroboam, who d did the false things here in Ephraim. So give, O ear, O house of the king of the Middleek, for yours is the judgment, judgment of the Lord's coming from your precepts and commandments to going away from my heart. heart. God is a God of love, but God is a God of judgment too. He knows the heart and he'll give you time to repent. You know, some of these, uh, some of these false teachers that come out and say, well, God, this God of the Old Testament, he's God of wrath. And look, he's always wrath and the God of the New Testament is kumbaya. Well, first of all, in Revelation, Jesus, the second coming in the book of Revelation, he's not coming back kumbaya. He's coming back as the roaring lion, the king of Judah, and he's going to usher in with a sword. It's, it's the, the bridal blood of judgment is going to come up to the top of, of the neck of a horse. So it's, it's the same God, but he's a God of uh, a judgment, but he's a God of patience too. You got to remember how long it took him to get this year, to get this part. Now we know Judah, and when we do our study in Jeremiah, we'll explain this. Jeremiah prophesies because the Lord told him 70 years to the day that they would go into captivity to Babylon. This happens after the Assyrians take out Israel, then God's judgment with Nebuchadnezzar in, um, on, the na on the nation of Judah, uh, and Jeremiah prophesies about this. It would be 70 years to the day. And we see Jesus talking about that in the Gospels. And uh, you get a lot of false teachers on this too because they've been raised in denomination teaching. Uh, some of your scripture was, when they were asked, how, how, how long are we supposed to forgive our brothers? Seven times. So they didn't make seven times out of the top of the air. It's the, it, that's in the Torah. Your forgiveness is, is, is the, the penalty is seven times. Whatever you did wrong would be seven times. So you'd forgive them sometimes. And they, some of your, uh, man, some of your uh, translations will seven, say 77. That's wrong. And uh, it's 70. And uh, the, the reason it's 70, 70 is a generation. And uh, it was 490 years that God was patient with the nation of Judah before he acted. And that's why they were in captivity for exactly 70 years to the day. That was 70 Shemitahs. Remember, a Shemitah is a seven-year period. On the seventh year, you release the slaves under the law. You, re you let the land heal. And if you're obedient, there will be a blessing. If you're disobedient, there will be uh, repercussions. They were disobedient for 70 Shemitahs, 490 physical years. So that's why Jesus said, no, not seven, 70 times seven. He was being literal. That's seven times seven. That God is a patient God and he's forgiving. But even to the point of 490 years, God is saying enough, you didn't repent. And now there's going to be judgment and it will be 70 years to the day. And it was 70 years to the day. And Daniel believed Jeremiah said, as the prophet Jeremiah said, it would be 70 years to the day. And it was 70 years to the day because of the 70, uh, 70 Shemitahs or 490 years. As we mentioned in some of our other studies, all the rabbis believe that all of history is broken down into segments of 490 years because of that and because of the Torah. So when you know the numbers and then you know the Torah and what they mean, it makes sense when Jesus said, no, seven times 70. He meant that literally. It wasn't a figure of speech. He meant that based on the law of the penalty and how long of the Shemitahs and also uh, what, what happened in the, in the Old Testament, the 490 years and 70 years to the captivity to the day. Because you have been a snare to mitz, mitzvah. You've been a snare to the watchtower. Mitzvah means watchtower. Watchtower is, uh, was always a symbol that God used as he used his prophets, specifically Ezekiel. He called him watchman on the watchtower. Because in ancient Israel, the surround their cities, they would have these big walls of protection. Jerusalem had these big walls. Yes, walls, America. Yes, they have walls, so they vet people to come in, so they see their enemy before they got in. That's why they didn't have drugs back in Israel back then. They never had drugs coming in. I'm half kidding on that, but it's true. You got you, you got to you got to vet them. You got to keep them out. So the watchtower, the watchman on the watchtower, was always looking for the to see who was coming, and they would see from far distance whether it was it was an enemy to be prepared for battle or whether it was a friend or foe. And he says, you've been a snare on my watchtower. You did things the wrong way. You weren't doing things in the way of the Lord as my watchman and doing things as a prophet. And, he, 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 and a net to spread around uh, Tabor. Tabor means a mound. A mound surround a net around you. You get caught up in your own games. I'm 
the God of the universe, and I put a net around your mound. He's being very specific. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter. They're slaughtering the people for their own precepts and commandments. They're not my precepts and commandments. They're going against the way from me. They're playing the harlot to false gods. Remember Ahab and Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel. We're praying to Baal and asterisk uh, uh, prophets and prophetess in Ephraim on Samaria, Mount Samaria, uh, the, 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 the Samaritans. They were playing the harlot, literally. I know Ephraim. So this is why he's referring to Ephraim specifically. Ephraim was the area of the Samaritans and Ephraim was the area that Jeroboam set up all these practices under the nation of Israel when they split away from Judah. And Israel is not hidden from me. I see everything you do, says the Lord Most High. And now, O Ephraim, you commit a harlotry, a harlotry. Israel is defiled. You've defiled her because of what you're doing in the land of Ephraim and Samaria. The things that you're doing to false gods, you're bringing in the Baals and in the, in the Asterisks, and you're letting the spirit of Jezebel and a literal Jezebel and Ahab run wild into my, my kingdom glory. I created Israel for my glory, and you have taken it to, to, to harlotry of false gods that don't move, as we see with the story of Elijah when he rained down fire on Mount Carmel to the 400 God, uh, prophets of Baal and the 400 uh, uh, asterisk prophets of, uh, prophetess of um, Jezebel. And God showed who the true fire God is in rain down fire. They do not direct their deeds towards or toward turning to their, their God, their Elohim, the one God and three in the Hebrew, the God of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, again, as we say, grammatically, Elohim in Hebrew means three. Can't mean two, can't mean four, it's three. In Judaism, they say number three is the completion of God's Spirit, and that's absolutely perfect. For the spirit of harlotry is in their midst, and they do not know the Yehovah. They've gone away from Yehovah to their own harlotry and their own precepts or commandments from false gods that just don't do anything. Remember Elijah was, 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 was mocking them. Where is your God? He's not showing up. Where is he? He's a God of fire. Why isn't he raining down fire? Is he sleeping? Is he relieving himself? He's just mocking them, and they start cutting themselves. You know, cutting is the sign of the evil one. The sudden cutting is the sign of the devil. And that's what the Lord said never to cut, never cut. You notice that a lot of our kids today go through some drug addiction, and they, and they start to cut themselves. Well, that's the evil one. Remember, we told you that the, the word pharmacia uh, comes from the Greek word of, of pharmaia, pharmaica, and that means uh, witchcraft. So this, these drugs are literally witchcraft. That's why we need towers. We need to have walls to get, stop these drugs from coming in. And they do not know the Jehovah. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore, Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. They're committing iniquity. Remember, iniquity is the highest level of sin. That means you know what is right. You know what God knows. It's, it's, it's what is right, and you're doing it against him anyway. Judah also stumbles with them. Judah was falling and playing the harlot as well. They just weren't as deep and far down the road as, uh, as Israel at this particular time. That's why Israel goes first into captivity captivity to the Assyrians. We're going to see Israel reaches out and, and hope to have the Assyrians help them, but the Assyrians will then, we know through history, take take them over, and then Nebuchadnezzar will come in and take on Judah and three sieges. Uh, with their flock and their herds, they shall go down and seek the Jehovah, and, but they will not find him because their hearts are not. You won't find Jehovah God or Elohim if your heart's not there. You know, my son has mentioned this many times. He says, oh, sometimes God just doesn't talk to me because he wants a quick, easy in and easy out. He just wants to get in his Bible and he gets all frustrated. He wants to spend a couple, last night he got all upset before the football game. He says, turn the TV off. I, 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 want, to, I want to get into the word. And there's too much distraction around. And he, he, I said, well, go, go into your room and do it. Go in a quiet place. That's where you meet, mediate with the Lord. You talk to the Lord. He wanted to do it quick. And doing it quick is not going to get it. It's not going to work. And that's what they were seeking his face. If, they, if they're going to do it not with all their heart, he's not going to speak to you. He's not going to talk to you. But when you go into that quiet place and he knows your heart and you're diligently seeking him, you'll find him. And he did it. And he came back and he goes, I feel a lot better. And it's always just a condition of the heart getting us into a safe, quiet place that we can just meditate and get in his word. And, and, and we'll feel his glory. 
And that's what he wants us to do. That's that heart relationship, not just going through the motions, not doing false, uh, you know, false prayers and just to go through the motions and your heart's not there, not your false incense, not your false circumcision, not your false, uh, 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 all the falseness of the, then. He wants the heart, as he told Jeremiah, the, the heart is incurably wicked. I don't want their sacrifices. I don't want their circumcision. I don't want their burnt offerings. I've always wanted the heart. And that's what he's talking to us today. It's a love relationship. Even though they played the harlot, both Israel and Judah, the remnant, he's always, he's, even in his wrath, he's saying, I have a door open for you. Come back. And he will come back. But it's going to take affliction. And that's it is the way it is in our lives, too. It takes affliction in our lives for us to turn to the Lord. It took affliction in my life to turn to the Lord and give it to him finally. And uh, being a stubborn goat, it's unfortunate that we have to do it that way, but God loves us so much that he's going he's gonna to put a path in us that we're going to have a come to Jesus moment, literally. And that moment, do we turn and become an apostle Paul and see Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus? Not now, now not all of us are going to have a Paul experience where Jesus Christ comes down, but there will be moments in your life where there are truly come to Jesus moments. And you're going to pick the fork in the road as Yogi Berra is. If you see a fork in the road, pick it up. That's Christ. Pick it up and accept him right there. And that is what the, the, that will be one of the greatest regrets if you move on from that moment because he's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So they shall go seek the Jehovah, but they will not find him because their heart's not there. He has withdrawn himself from them, but he's always still there. He's withdrawn, but he's still waiting, and he's always everywhere. He's withdrawn because you've rejected him. People say, whoa, whoa. Where is God in all these school shootings? Will you kick God out of school? Where is God in all these government shootings? Will you kick God out of the government? God is here. He's just saying, welcome me back in. Make me the God of the United States of America. Make me your God as the God of Elohim through my son, Jesus Christ. And I'll give you that joy, peace, hope that the world cannot take away. He's always there. But the world is pushing him back. Are you pushing him back? Is the United States of America pushing him back or do we need to stand in the gap to get him back in? Do you welcome him back into these things? What's wonderful about two things that are, are changing that I've heard about, <clears throat> whether you're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. Uh, the Capitol is, uh, there's members of Trump's cabinet and the vice president and uh, I think General Mathis, uh, Mattis is one of them. They're having Bible studies in, uh, in, in the White House. That's just incredible. That's uh, awesome. And I've been told that Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, when he started his last, uh, uh, his last presidency in two or his prime ministry in 2016 was actually doing Bible studies in the um, the prime minister's office too. That's that's what God is looking for. Are we seeking, even if you're the leader and prime minister of Israel or you're the uh, in the government official or the vice president of the United States of America, we humble ourselves to seek the most high God because if God isn't with us, we have no chance. The only way that we're gonna prevail is that God is in us and with us and around us and we have our, his, our savior, Jesus Christ, in us and around us. For they have forgotten, uh, they have dealt treacherously, treacherously with their Jehovah, for they have begotten pagan children. They went and because of the Assyrians, they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They were supposed to continue to keep the, the, the marriage line, remember it was in the law, that you keep it in the tribe. The reason that God wanted to keep it in the tribe so they wouldn't be corrupted by pagan gods. So they created pagan children. And we know once they went in and Assyria, they intermingled and they brought in pagan rituals into their life and pagan gods, and it was contaminated. And that's what God want, never had wanted. He'd always wanted them to be the, the God of the universe. And uh, God always in the Old Testament had a way for the aliens, the strangers of the land to come in the United States. So this, you know, these politicians that are teaching about sanctuary cities, which they have not a clue what it means biblically, and uh, what, what Jesus would let aliens in. Well, Jesus said that, you, that uh, he was gonna, in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, he's gonna com uh, come and fulfill the law to, uh, to, to every yacht and tittle, the law and the prophets. So that means he's gonna do everything in the Old Testament exactly the way God wrote it. And in the Old Testament, an alien could come into your midst. He could come into your city and these cities had gates. So the alien could come into your gates, into your city, but they were vetted. They were vetted because they had to obey the laws of the Torah. So that means they had to obey the one God. 
So they had to commit themselves to Elohim and all his precepts and commandments, the literal of the five books of Moses. So then they were allowed to come in and they could take part of the Jewish, uh, uh, the J Jewish things, even though they were aliens of the land. Because God says, you were once aliens of the lands in Egypt, let them come in. However, they have to be vetted, they have to, they have to follow my law, and they have to honor me, the one God, Elohim. Many politicians don't tell you that part. Blow the shofar. Uh, or we forgot the last part of seven. Now a new moon shall devour them and their heritage. The new moon, would they blow the shofar for the new moon to come in, recognizing the new year, Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Shofars, where two witnesses have to see the crescent of the moon that could come in a 48-hour window. And that is their heritage. They're not following it. They blow, the, they look for the new moons, but they're not recognizing the purpose of the God of the universe. So he says, blow the shofar uh, in Gibeah, the trumpet in Rama, and cry aloud at a house of event. Look behind you, O Benjamin, wake up. I'm blowing, blowing of the shofar. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. There will be desolate in the day of rebuke. And that's exactly what happened. Among the tribes of Israel, I'll make known what is sure. That's why Ephraim and Dan always get the backhand by the Holy Spirit. Rarely do you see anything good about Ephraim and Dan. And Ephraim and Dan are not in the, uh, they're not of the 12 in the book of Revelation. And this is the reason why. Dan also did that as well. They were bringing up idols and false gods in their areas of, of the tribe that God gave them the land under Moses. Uh, among the tribes of Israel, I'll make known what is sure. The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark and I will pour out my wrath on them like water. Removing of the landmark was something that God says you should not move the, ram, uh, the, the landmark in, um, uh, or make false landmarks of your neighbor in the law. A lot of people don't know what that means. He means the territory that I gave you of your land, if you go out to you know, like my land here today, uh, on his glory and where we live, we have actually have landmarks out there. A lot, a lot of places don't have landmarks. On both sides of our land, there's a mark. I was just showing my son our landmark the other day. He couldn't believe it went out that far. Uh, but in ancient Israel, they had landmarks to show this is the land of Jesse or uh, David, the house of uh, Bar Jesse, the uh, uh, son of Jesse. So this was your land. So to steal the landmark was stealing. So the people, what they would do is move the landmark so that they could increase their land by a, 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 by a deceitful way. And God is saying, I see everything you're doing. You do not play with the landmarks. I gave you that land specifically. You don't do it uh, unethically. The princes of Judah are those who remove a landmark. The word princes is uh, sar. Uh, my son, oldest son was asking uh, what the name of in Hebrew was for uh, a prince. It's, if you're watching, it's Sar. And uh, the reason we said that is because there was a shelter dog uh, in uh, my daughter found uh, that if we couldn't find a home, we were going to bring him back home and we were going to name it as something in the Hebrew. And he and our, our other German shepherds, her name is Zara, which means princess in Hebrew. And since he's a boy, uh, German Shepherd, they, he said, well, why don't we name him Prince? And he didn't know the name, and it's Sar, S-A-R. I will pour out my wrath like water if you move the landmarks. God's, God's uh, judgment's coming. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he is willingly walked by human precept. He's walking by human precept. He's worshiping these other gods, these Baal gods, these asterisk gods, with gods of nothing. They fall down. They're like Dagon. Boop, they all they go down. There's one God, and they're not worshiping him. They're doing it from the human perspective. The world took them away from the most high God. Therefore, I will be like Ephraim, like a moth, a moth to a flame. He comes back as the burning flame. Uh, it comes back with the feet of bronze, the fire judgment coming, a moth to a flame. Have you ever watched that? It's just, it's, bizarre how a moth just gravitates to that flame and gone and to the house of judah like rottenness the house of judah was becoming rotten because they weren't following the precepts and commandments we know that it wasn't until hezekiah uh or was it josiah uh it was josiah it wasn't until josiah that they actually took the book of the law and started reading it again they went from king a king after king after king not reading the law and that was a requirement under the Torah. The Torah said that the king must read of the, of, of the scripture of his precepts and commandments 
every day. And they didn't do it from generation to generation of the kings. That's why they didn't go well. And then you get a godly king like Josiah and Hezekiah and they bring it back out and do the things of the Lord and they had blessings until they turned the other way. And uh, as we said earlier, some scholars believe that's why Josiah uh, met his death in the book of Kings is uh, that he was going out into battle to take the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant back uh, from uh, the Egyptians. Uh, some think that it uh, got to... Um, uh, got to uh, went over to uh, Africa area, um, Ethiopia. Um, a lot of good evidence to show that the Ethiopians had that, and the Mossad brought that back in the the 1900s uh, or uh, 19, 1990s when uh, the Ethiopian Jews were going back into the land. Going to fulfill what God is going to say here in uh, verse 15. Amazing, because these times are coming right before our very eyes. Watch Israel. Watch what's going on. Bible prophecy literally being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And the house of Judah like rottenness. Verse 13. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, and Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the king Jerob, yet he cannot cure you nor heal you of your wound. When they got sick and they're going through their, their affliction, they sought the king of a pagan, not the God of the universe. So God's saying, when I'm in your affliction, seek me. I am the living God. And they didn't do it. They even rebelled to a pagan king that will take them into captivity. And then finally, God is going to do that to the nation of Judah through Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king as well. They worshiped other gods. And he says, I am your God. All I wanted you to come back to me in the heart. I'm here. But you go to Assyria, you, you, you bring them. And Hezekiah, you bring in the Babylonians and you show them. After I give you a second chance in life, you show them all the secrets of my kingdom and my house and my treasury. He tested them and he allowed them to know exactly what they had. That's why the Babylonians came. God knew what they were going to do before they were going to do it. It was all first precepts and commandments it was exactly on the perfect date. As we see, Ezekiel 4 prophecy, the exact date of the date, the first, or, um, first time the Nebuchadnezzar came in. Uh, was uh, came from that time on was May 14th, 1948 to the exact day. Ezekiel 4 prophesizing when the nation of Israel would become a nation again. And as we said before, it's Israel. It's not, it's not Judah and Israel anymore. It's Israel. They're, they're in the affliction. They're united in these end days. Uh, so he nor heal your wounds. So the, the, the pagan gods, the kings of the, the, of the earth, the, the, the great empires, the Chinas, the Russias, the North Koreas, these powers, the, uh, Iran trying to recreate the Persian Empire, all these empires, they come and they go. They come and they go, Hobbes. But they can't rescue you. The only one that can rescue you is the God of the universe. And we seek these kingdoms, we seek these powers, and we seek this wealth. We seek that in the seven pillars of society when God's saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the only thing to sustain you. I am the only thing to give you joy, peace, hope. Come to me, son and daughter, not to the world. You won't find fulfillment in the world. You're going to find frustration. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. This is where uh, the young lion and lion, we won't to get into the details, but if you study our Ezekiel 38 and 39, this is giving you another hint of the lion and the young lion and who the young lion is and how this will show you that the United States of America is in the Ezekiel 38 and 39 uh, war that is uh, going to be after the Psalm 83 war, but the, the parties are all in place for the first time ever. You can get that study on our website, uh, www.hisglory.tv. But he's talking about the young lion and the old lion. And uh, if you watch The Crown, that Netflix series about the queen, uh, that's how Great Britain, they were, got the symbol of the, of, of the lion. They believed that they were Jewish and they were from the tribe of Judah. That's why England brought on the, the, the lion as its emblem. And that's the reference of the young lion who was born out of the lion. The United States of America rebelled against Great Britain and became the United States of America to be the young lion. And I, even I, will tear them away and go away. And I will take them away and no one shall rescue I am the God of the universe, and my son will be coming in the line of the tribe of Judah in the line of David to fulfill my everlasting covenant. And here is a highlight in your Bible. This is a, this is a verse that we, we reference so many, so many times because this is a reference to the end days. 
This is a reference to what's going on today as the name of Israel. People are coming more, uh, coming back to Israel uh, like no time in history. It's blossoming as a rose, uh, as a flower, as Isaiah said. Uh, Ezekiel 4, a nation born in one day. They got East Jerusalem on June 6, 1967. That was the third exactly to the day. Um, the, 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 uh, they're speaking Hebrew. They got the shekel back in the land. Uh, the, the Jewish people, up until five years ago, there was more Jewish people living in uh, the United States of America than there was in Israel. And today, there is more Jews in, in Israel than there are in the United States of America. Uh, I believe there's 6.6 .6 million Jews in Israel today. I can't remember the exact number, uh, but I think it's like 5.7 million in the United States. And there's something like 13.3 million total Jews. I just, just came out the other day. But the point is they're going back into the land. We saw the Ethiopian Jews that I mentioned earlier in the 1990s. Then the Russian Jews went back. Uh, Polish Jews have gone back. They're going back into the land. And there was a special agreement that the, the, the nation of Israel gave, um, special citizenship. If you could show your Jewish heritage, you could come back into Israel and become a, uh, a Jewish citizen. So if you could show your Jewish heritage, you can go in and become a Jewish citizen. So I have now records myself of being from the tribe of Judah. So I could, if I wanted to, go back and get a dual citizenship in Israel based on this because of showing that I'm of the tribe of Judah. And that's literally happening right before our very eyes. The other thing is, there are more Jews coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ today than any time in history. And those are the end days. We know that. And, uh, and amazing. We shared this week, too, that they found that a red heifer was born in Israel. Remember, the ashes of the red heifer are one of the last things they need to do to build the third temple. And we know there'll be a third temple built. And uh, the, the, people always ask me, how do you know there's going to be a third temple built? Because Jesus said so. And because Daniel said so. He says, when the abomination of desolation takes place by the Antichrist, these events will happen. Jesus said it, confirming the prophet Daniel. And uh, the, obviously, you, you can't make abomination desolate unless the third temple is built. And as we mentioned many times, you can Google the Temple Institute. They have all the elements, including this red heifer that was just born, uh, to, to build the third temple. They just need the go-ahead to do go ahead and build it up on Mount Moriah. Uh, here's verse 15 and we'll read it and then we'll explain it. This is incredible. This is coming. This is the day of the Lord. This is, this, this is the day of the Lord, literally, that, that the God is speaking in end time. I will return again to my place. Where's his place? Jerusalem, his holy city, and to his nation, Israel. Remember, they were out of the land for so many years. And God is fulfilling this. See, they're reestablished in, in May 14th, 1948, the nation. Reestablished the entire city of Jerusalem, June 6, 1967. The shekel, the speaking in Hebrew, he's doing everything he said to this prophet 2,500 years ago. Till they acknowledge their offense. What does he mean by that? It means in their affliction in the end days, in the book of Revelation, they're going to be afflicted from chapter 4 on when the two witnesses come and the 12,000 of each tribe. The, the affliction of the tribulation the Jewish remnant will know the Lord and they will call upon the Lord and know who the Messiah is. Remember in our teaching in the book of Revelation, the woman that bears the child, the woman is Israel bearing the Messiah, meaning in their affliction, they'll realize that the Messiah was born and he is the Messiah and they will accept the Christ as their Lord and Savior and he will return to the place he left, meaning Jerusalem. And the King of Kings and Lord of Hosts will be in Jerusalem for a thousand years to fulfill the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant to the house of Israel as well, a dual covenant being come together. He said, they will seek my face. They will seek my face when this event happens. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. They will be afflicted in these end days. There's going to be, as the scripture says, there was six million Jews, uh, which was one third of the Jewish population wiped out in the, 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 the horrible Holocaust. We know in the Bible prophecy that two thirds will be the next one. This is, this is gonna be horrible affliction. But in that affliction, the Lord is gonna hear from him the cries of his people, his remnant of the Jewish people. And they were gonna seek his face and he will return to the place he left. He will re return to the place he left. They'll earnestly seek me. What a joyous time. 
that they're going to seek the Lord and uh, the Lord will be coming in with his King of Kings and Lord of Hosts to usher in the Davidic covenant. We're close. We're close to this event because all the things that are leading up to the event are here. Everything Jesus said in Matthew 24 is speeding up, speeding up, and speeding up. We're looking for Hosea 5.15 that that will happen. And we know by the book of Revelation that indeed happens. Israel is the center of the universe today. But from Revelation 4 on, it's all about Israel seeking their faith, seeing the two witnesses, the 12,000 of each of the tribes, 144,000, the woman given birth to the child that the dragon wanted to kill. Why did the dragon want to kill it? Because he's the savior of the world. It's the Messiah. As Isaiah said, a child is born, meaning he will be born literally of woman to fulfill Genesis 3.15, the seed of a woman. Biologically incorrect, it means the virgin birth of the Messiah by the Holy Spirit. Right? We mentioned earlier this week, too, that they believe, scientists believe this, and they haven't proved it yet, but they believe this. It's a theory that once you accept Jesus Christ in you in salvation, your DNA, when the Holy Spirit comes into you, your DNA actually changes. So you truly are born again. Uh, we'll have to watch that very closely. That just came out the, this last week or, or, or on Friday. Um, so the child was born, he literally born uh, in, in, uh, in fulfilling Genesis 3.15, and a son is given. Two words in the Hebrew, two, two separate things. The son of God is given. He's both man and God. And the, he will be called Mighty El. He'll be called Mighty God. This is Isaiah saying this, uh, a prophet that is a prophet in the Quran. Isaiah telling the, who the son of God is. And he'll be born of David, and, but he will be the son of God, and he will be called mighty El. El means in Hebrew, God. And the government will be on his shoulders. What does that mean? He will be fulfilling this as a king of kings, Lord of hosts, fulfilling the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. In the affliction, the Jewish people will get it and they'll seek the face of the Lord, and the Lord will return to his mighty city, Jerusalem. And David will be king of Israel again. And the Lord Almighty will be King of Kings and Lord of Hosts. Praise his name. We pray that Hosea 5 uh, has been a blessing to you. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob blow the shofar. God bless you.